Right. Are we on? We're on. All right, all right. Once again, giving a shot at trying to make this thing happen, the pre-concert talk bit of business. And uh, we tonight's concert, we have three pieces of music um, and three very different pieces of music, but they all play off of each other really wonderfully. <coughs> the first piece that, that you will hear is uh, Dmitry Shostakovich Sinfonietta uh, Opus 110A. This is a piece that he wrote um, uh, originally as a string quartet, and then uh, with the aid of a friend, a violist, they, they reorchestrated it into for a small orchestra as well, and it's a very powerful piece. One thing to start right out with, in, in 2017, there was a movie called The Mummy with Tom Cruise. And this is, this is very important. You are saying, well, what does this have to do with anything? But when The Mummy <coughs> is, is lifted on an airplane out of the desert, and as she is taken away, the desert responds, and all of a sudden we get, ba 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 which is, Dmitry Shostakovich's symf uh, signature, symphonic signature. And from that point on, every time she is seen, we get ba da 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 d s c h This was a, this was a, a gesture that he used uh, relatively, early on he didn't use it much at all, but eventually, for instance, in his 10th symphony, which he wrote right after Stalin died. And this was his way of sort of saying, ha ha, uh, Joseph, you are dead and I am still here. And so throughout the symphony, there is this gesture that he keeps saying, I am present here and you are not. Um, so anyhow, the reason I point this out is because that's a very definite gesture. Ba -da -da -da. And you, when he, when Shostakovich used it in his eighth string quartet, and ultimately then also in this this symphonietta that you will hear this evening, um, it is everywhere. It is everywhere. Now, what? Why was he using it? Why he went to Dresden to write to come up with? He was going to do this music for this movie, which ultimately he did the music for, but. That's another thing. The fact of the matter was he went to Dresden to get an idea, to get inspiration for the movie, for the mu music for the movie, and it just wasn't happening. And, and he was having a terrible time. He was spending days, and it was like, uh, and he couldn't get it together, and it was like the city wanted him to write something else. Like Dresden wanted, was saying, here, you have to write this first. You have to write the story of Dmitry Shostakovich in Dresden. And, and once he decided to do that, it all just fell into place. And so here is this piece of music, this chamber symphony. It's five movements long. It starts right out with his, with his signature, G-S-C-H. And it's throughout the entire piece. It's, it's just everywhere. It's just everywhere. Um, he also, the, the trick with Dresden was that this was a very beautiful city that ultimately was uh, right at the end of the war, the Americans and the British decided to just get rid of all their bombs on top of Dresden. So a city that was, that was pretty much kind of unscathed, uh, got really tossed to the four winds, and, uh, and it, there was just a, a, there are a lot of people who feel very bad about this, and uh, they, but the idea was that the city was kind of, was really demolished. And then when, um, because Dresden is in East Germany, the East Germans did not, were in no rush to rebuild the city, 
And when they did rebuild it, they rebuilt it in these concrete block structures. It wasn't rebuilding the beautiful buildings that had, that had uh, originally been there, which they did in, in West Germany. But in East Germany, the government wanted people to realize that this is what the Americans did. And the end result is that it, that it stayed scarred like this. So, so Shostakovich goes there and he sees what should be a beautiful city and is, and is in many ways not. And so he goes there and he starts writing this, this piece. It's five movements long. The uh, first movement, it, he really, it, 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 he's talking about himself. He's talking about his life his early life, and so he uses quotes from his first symphony, which he which he wrote when he was in college. The um, the uh, the second movement is all about the 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 genocide of of, of World War Two, and that the uh, there is a there is a, a Jewish melody that is that is in there, and. Uh, because he liked using using tunes that had particular meaning for him, and uh, the third movement is the scherzo, uh, which ideally is is uh, scherzos are supposed to be lighter, but it, 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 it is there is nothing that is light about this. The um, the third movement is, however, a dream sequence, and in this dream sequence, it, he is it, it's like he's going through the card catalog. From, from all of his life, and he picks out little bits and pieces of, of, in his dreams of, of what he has done. The fourth movement, yeah, he, he introduces Stalin. It's the post-war the post um, business, as far as this all is concerned. This is, this is after World War II, and Stalin is, is totally in charge. And it is, it's the th fourth movement starts out with three knocks at the door, boom, boom, boom. And then he does it repeated on a, a, a number of kinds, times. But this was what Shostakovich was afraid that any day now, people were, they, they, the KGB was going to come to his house and take him away. He was, he was sleeping with his jacket on and with his bags packed and his family upstairs so that they would not be bothered when they came in to break into the house to take him away. And, uh, and he is expecting that, 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 that this is going to happen, a nocturnal uh, visit, if you will. And he quotes a Russian prison song called Tortured and Enslaved. And this becomes almost a requiem for what is what has been going on and uh, eventually this is an interesting concept it, it gradually breaks down into uh, this this extended cello solo and it is listed as the climax of the piece but instead of building to the climax it pulls away to a climax of virtually nothing. It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting way to sort of give people what they don't expect. The fifth movement returns to the ideas from the opening movement, and, um, and it has been described as returning to his youth and to his despair. And this is, there's such a darkness to this, it's a very beautiful piece. It's a very wonderful piece, and I and I and I hope you're going to enjoy it. I can't imagine. It, it is. It's one of these things where you, you don't want to say, "Boy, I really liked that." It's like, no. It's it's like tragic beyond tragic, and it is overlaid with. Uh, and so, anyhow, so there is essentially 20th century Dresden, and. And Shostakovich sort of is showing you what it looks like from his point of view. The second piece on this program is 
the Mendelssohn uh, Piano Concerto, the first of his two piano concertos. This, uh, this is a remarkable, remarkable piece. Just as with Shostakovich, Shostakovich has all these youthful interjections, but it's, it's, it's his youth and despair. And with Mendelssohn, there is no despair. With Mendelssohn, he's writing this, he's 21 years old. He is, uh, to a certain extent, he's very much in love. And he is a prodigy. He has been famous for forever and forever, all over Europe, for his, for his ability to play violin, his ability to play the piano, his, his composition, all of this stuff, his ability to improvise, um, just a, a, and, and he's encouraged in this, always been encouraged in this. Well, so here he is, he, he meets a young girl named, and let me, let me see here, uh, uh, Del, Delphinia or something to that effect. It's ultimately the woman to whom he dedicates this concerto. He had, he played duets with her and all this sort of stuff and uh, had become very enamored of her and was really, and then people, but when people would ask him, so, so is this, is this the love of your life? Is this something that you're really going to work with? And he said, oh no, she's a wonderful person and I really like her, but she's, but there is this, this, this young Scottish girl that I am really in love with. And of course, does he tell us who this is? No! And, and so that means we either have to do all sorts of, all sorts of digging around and sort of trying to figure out fact checking and all this sort of stuff, or we can just make some stuff up. Like for instance, what other stuff was he writing at this time? So this is in 1830 and 1831. He is, he's essentially, he's, he's 20, 21 years old, 22 maybe, and he is also writing his Italian symphony, and he is writing the Hebrides Overture. The Hebrides are in Scotland, and I would bet you anything that this little piece of music is his, is his Scottish girlfriend, that he is, he's just sort of throwing this out there, and, and that essentially leave, doesn't leave a trail, but it's just there, it's just there, and it doesn't mean that, that this Delphinia is not significant. In fact, she could be more significant than we realize. But nonetheless, uh, 20 years, 25 years after Mendelssohn died, uh, there was a performance of this work done, uh, and Delphinia did play the piano part. So, there is a connection there that's very real. The, uh, the amazing thing about this, this piece is this is written literally like four years after Beethoven died. And when you listen to, when you listen to Beethoven piano concertos and they're, they're, they're heroic and they're powerful and there's all this stuff, and then you get the Mendelssohn piano concerto that is literally written, uh, written like four years after Beethoven dies, and it is gorgeous. It is so romantic. It is so powerful. It is so, uh, there's hints of Beethoven, but it's more than that. It's, 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 it's voluptuous. It's luxurious. And um, it makes me think that Delphinia might have been a very attractive woman. And maybe this is, this is telling us this. The opening, the opening movement is, is heroic. It is strong. It has a lot of it, it has it has strong music and it it's, it settles back and it's and it's and it's and it's very very wonderful. Then to get into the second movement, suddenly we have because this is how you do. You have fast, slow, fast, strong, uh, and then pastoral, and then strong again. Um, the second movement is 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 very beautiful, very touching. Um, very much, very rhapsodic, and and it is just, 
charming, charming, charming. And to a very real extent, it's charming in a way that Beethoven doesn't do. This is romantic. This is, this is beautifully romantic. And then the last movement is, of course, uh, is again fast, because fast, slow, fast, the contrast. And, but it is also, the last, the last movement is brilliant. Brilliant, lots of all over the place, which is something Beethoven never did. Beethoven essentially played the piano with hammers. <laughs> and, and you get this, this really forecasting of what the romantic piano, piano concerto can become. And so, so this is what you have, a very beautiful early work by Mendelssohn, but you have no awareness that it is at all early. This is, it is a, it is a beautiful work and it's a wonderful work. The last thing on the program is the second to the last symphony that Mozart wrote. Mozart uh, had spent his life, he wrote 41 symphonies, and he, like Mendelssohn, uh, was a, a child prodigy, and uh, he, he traveled all over Europe, uh, playing piano and playing violin and writing music and organizing stuff, and, and his, his parents, his father essentially lived off of him for years, and they traveled all over the place. And, um, but the one thing that Mozart was dealing with that other people did not have to deal with in that, uh, in, uh, in this concert, uh, was he, patrons, somebody to pay for him to do what he did. And Franz Joseph Haydn had a patron who paid for everything that he did, but he put demands on him as well. And, uh, and Haydn was very malleable to all this. Mozart was not malleable. In Mozart's eyes, these people were, forgive me, these people were morons. They knew nothing about music, yet they were telling him how to write what he was, what, what he was writing. And they always did that, and he resented it. He resented being told, having people tell him what his music needed to sound like, where the flaws were, because he didn't see that there were any flaws um, because there were none. You know, this is, this is the way this is. Salieri said at the end of his life, the problem with Mozart's music is that it's always perfect. It was always perfect. And, and he said, and the idea was that he would just write it down and it was immediately, it was ready to be uh, rehearsed and performed. There weren't, they didn't, didn't pick up pieces and, and fix things because he didn't have to. So there was just, but the, so the trick with Mozart was that the last 10 years of his life, he decided he would move to Vienna and he would make a living as a composer and a concert artist. He would put on concerts and he would make his living doing concerts. That's what he wanted to do. And the, uh, the problem with this was that he would put on concerts and there were all of these, all of these critics who decided that, who does he think he is? He doesn't know what he's talking about. Basically, they didn't understand what he was doing and so they, rather than figure out what he was doing, they decided to tell everybody that this is garbage, that this isn't the way music is written and this became the problem. And by the time we get to the last three years of his life, Mozart is, has, decides to write these, these, three, these three symphonies. And they, they uh, come together very quickly, essentially over, over a, a, a month's time. And, uh, and this is the 39th, 40th, and 41st symphony. The, the cool thing about, there's much that's cool about his 40th. It is, he wrote only two symphonies in a minor key, and they are both in G minor. This one and the one, what is it, number 25 or something like that. 
Um, and the, 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 the trick was that in this age of enlightenment, in the classical era, which was essentially the pre-romantic, post-Baroque era, there was this desire that, that music, if it was really significant music, should uplift people and should be positive and so sort of glowing and sort of and, and not not heavy-handed or dark or have any sort of uh, uh, a, a sort of human pathos or angst, goodness, and uh, and and it was felt that that's what happened with with the minor keys, and so the idea was that that everything, virtually everything, was in major keys, and and so when 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 Mozart does this and writes this. It's, it's an interesting thing because the, it doesn't necessarily sound sad. It sounds very, it, 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 there's, there's a kind of a pensive motion to it and that sort of thing, but it's not, it definitely doesn't sound sad. And, and that's the thing that we, we, we've come to think with regard to when, when we think when uh, people were writing about, critics were writing about this symphony, just to give you an idea, when they were writing about this, the 40th symphony the, in G minor, and, and the critics described, some one critic decided, decided it was pain and lamentation, another critic describing the same music called it joy and animation, another one, called it feverish and, 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 and with concentrated energy. Another one called it comedic and another one called it grief stricken and another one called ordinary or mild or fatalistic uh, or charming or rapturous. And this is the same piece of music, the same piece of music. You can see where Mozart was, was, was all set to, to pull his hair out because People, here were people who were telling, uh, telling his audience what they were going to hear, what to listen for, and, and, he, and they couldn't agree. They couldn't agree. And this wasn't, the idea is maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe that was what Mozart wanted, was that it didn't, it wasn't heavy, it wasn't morose, but it, it has a feel to it, a buoyancy about it. That, that overcomes the G minor aspect. Also, I remember being told when I was in college that, that just because you write a piece of music in a minor key, as you go through the, the, the twists and turns and the permutations and, and the like, you will find that very often there will be whole gestures that, that are actually in major keys um, within the concept of the, of the minor framework. So, it doesn't have to be, a song can be in a minor key and can be simply sad. But here, in, in a work, a large work such as this, uh, there, it, 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 it stumbles over itself, it flows over itself, and this happens and that happens, and it really, you get, you get a lot of different stuff going on, and it's very, very wonderful. The, um, this, as with so many symphonies, the 40th is, is in four movements. The first movement being, says, molto allegro. It just means fast. It means very fast. The second one, andante, that's the slow movement. In, in the classical symph symphony, the first movement essentially was balanced by the second movement. So you had have, you have a fast, strong movement, and then a slower, and more pensive and uh, uh, more, again, rhapsodic thing. And that was the plan, that was the plan. Those were the two major musical gestures in the classical symphony. Um, then the third movement was the minuet. And why a minuet? Because the minuet was a popular dance at the time. And, and so it was, you, you got this stronger, it, it, it's not like a waltz, which you feel. It's, 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 it's a little bit heavier, 
and, but, and, and more rhythmic, and it, so immediately there was another contrast here. And, but the nice thing about the minuet is that it essentially is strong, but it's not fast. And that meant that then for the last movement, you could have a, a movement that was faster again, and, and it wouldn't be like, like, just like the, you know, just like the scherzo that immediately goes into another fast movement. It's, it, 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 there was contrast again that was happening here. Where, um, the, uh, where the classical symphony after the minuet would very often have a rondo, which was very fast, very crazy, and not necessarily all that deep musically, um, and, uh, but very, uh, uh, very melodic. And what it did was, it, it, after the first two movements, which could conceivably put the audience to sleep, so you have this dance movement that would wake people up, and then you would have this last wild gesture to, to, to kick them out of the room and make them all crazy. And in this instance, uh, by the time you get to, to Mozart's last three symphonies, the last movement is essentially in sonata form, like the first one is. So the end result is that you have the symphony now, with Mozart, it's balanced out because of the first and the last movements, rather than the first and the second, with this little tag of these two shorter movements at the end. And uh, so, and this is what you get here. You get, you get fast, slow, dance-like, but not fast. And then you can have a final fast gesture that's, uh, that, and, and this is very brisk. It says allegro assai, but, but it is, it, which, means, which means a little bit slower than allegro, but almost invariably it is not done a sigh, because it's very energetic and very, it very much almost in the style of a rondo uh, that, the, that the classical symphony did, but but it is but it takes on the greater weight because it's sonata form, um, and uh, this is finally the thing that's about that's interesting with this symphony uh, is that it doesn't have an introduction. In, uh, in, in, in symphonic music, there was an introduction before you had your first theme and then the second theme. And the, the introduction was, was its own sort of little thing. It starts right off. And that's the first theme. You don't have any da -da 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 -bum -ba -da -bum -ba -da -bum. You don't have an introduction. It just immediately just does the first theme. So this this is interesting in the way that this was put together. It is it, it's fun this way. This whole concert, the first con the first piece, the Shostakovich, five me five movements, and they are all tied together. So it's literally it's one gesture, but it has five separate things involved in it. The Mendelssohn Piano Concerto, they are tied together. There's three movements and they are each tied together by a brass fanfare. So it is literally one gesture, but then with three compartments in it. And, uh, and there are, curiously too, with the Mendelssohn, there are no uh, uh, cadenzas, no place for the pianist to just say, you now that the orchestra stopped, so I can do all sorts of wild flourishes and show you how good I am. And the cool thing about that is, it's like, it's like Mendelssohn saying, saying, this is, I, I want you to see the piece. I don't want you to see the performer. I want you to see the piece. So this is a, um, this whole concert is, is, is a very wonderful presentation from the very dark first piece, the Shostakovich, to the very brilliant and youthful second piece, the piano concerto, and you will, you, you, you have to love it. It's a great, great piece of music, it is wonderful. 
And then the Mozart Symphony, which is, you know, he has, he wants to make this, 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 this is, this is supposed to be his art. He wants to demonstrate his art, what he is doing, and what he wants to do. He wasn't paid a commission to do these works. This work actually, according to whom you, you talk to, the only performance of this work that happened before Mozart's death was, was a performance that was conducted by, by Salieri, curiously enough, and with an orchestra of 180 pieces. It's like so totally over the top, so totally out there. And, uh, and it just, there's just, there's, there's odd stuff with all, of, with all of this stuff. But what we have here, three pieces of music, each one is inspired. Shostakovich inspired by, by Dresden. Uh, Mendelssohn inspired by this Delphinia uh, girl that he had become so enamored of. And Mozart wanting desperately to be free of the patronage system so that he could then, he could write the music that he heard in his art, the music that he wanted to write, thinking that this would be, this would be the great music that, that the people would remember him for. So, I think I have worn out my welcome, and so I hope you enjoy the concert. Thank you so very much, and I look forward to seeing real live people in this situation sometime soon. Thank you.